I'm David Brownlee, a professor in the History of Art Department, and this is my colleague Kathy Foster, who is the curator of the American section and the director of the Center for American Art here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And also a member of the History And also a member of the History of Art Department and, um, <laughs> and, has, and teaches in our faculty. And we have um, two chairs. Yes, yes. <laughs> but for the, we were for holding those who for... Are, for people who just didn't see I'm going to say a, a few introductory words, in, uh, saying a little bit about the, the, the project for this year in general terms. I'm somewhat at a disadvantage in doing that. David Fox, who's greeted you downstairs, knows more about it and can perhaps say something at the end um, and talk a little bit in general terms about the challenges and opportunities that come with introducing students to looking at works of art. And then Kathy is going to take us through these two great paintings. We'll look at the Gross Clinic here and at the Agnew Clinic, the other great uh, medical uh, scene that, uh, that Aikens painted, um, and which will be the centerpieces of our, of our discussion with students this year. Our students this year will be invited to look at paintings. And the challenge that I think that we face, and certainly my colleagues in the art history department and, and the curators here at the PMA feel, is that the challenge is to get them to actually look at paintings with the same kind of intensity and confidence that they'll pick up a, a, a poem or a piece of literature and read or look at that work and confident that they can understand it and have something to say about it and not drive them to look at secondary literature to find out what someone else had told them that they should see in it. And it's a bit of a daunting task. Um, and what we will be doing this summer is preparing a, a website that students will go to um, that will provide some kinds of background material, including a wonderful chapter from Elizabeth Johns's book on Thomas Aikens. Beth is a retired faculty member at Penn that introduces this painting, um, but which will also contain what I suppose we could call a study guide to these two paintings, in which Kathy and I will talk about these paintings and invite students into them and ask them questions about them and frankly try to reserve the answers for their own discovery. Um, what you're going to get today is the answers and is the questions and the answers uh, to that. But we're going to try to uh, we're trying to going to try to make it for students something more like, well, I guess you it's, it would be reasonable to call it something like a treasure hunt. Um, a couple of just a very general things that I, I uh, apologize for the obviousness of some of these things, but I think it's important to help your students in thinking about these works at some times to be quite obvious. Um, visual art, like works of literature, um, is, uh, is a, a powerful synthesis of structure and content, of form and meaning. And I think in analytic terms, it is actually helpful to think about these two separate areas. Um, a, like a work of literature that has a physical structure, chapters may have symmetry, may have repetition, may have balance or lack of it, may have emphasis, may have lack of emphasis, may um, move on to being maybe descriptive, maybe narrative, maybe elusive, maybe um, uh, uh, metaphorical. Works of art similarly have the ability to communicate through form and through a variety of levels of content. For works of art are first of all physical objects and I think it's useful to begin thinking about them as things, to think about them as, as, and to think about them in the language that we apply to things and to classify them and place them within the various cont continua of possibility that physical things uh, li uh, live among. They can be big, they can be small. They can have large or small scale. That's to say, objects within a painting can be large or small relative to the size of the painting. The objects, the, the, uh, the paintings can be organized horizontally or vertically. The objects within the paintings can be horizontal or vertical. Um, their things can be organized orthogonally or diagonally or something in between. Lines can be straight, lines can be curved, surfaces can be rough, surfaces can be smooth. Space can be, can be seem palpably real in, in paintings. The three-dimensionality of paintings can be very powerful. Or some and paintings can also seem extremely flat. Uh, the, um, the, the, the artist works in a world of creating illusionistic solid and void. And uh, just as you create solid, one also creates void. One creates things and the absence of things in art. And that 
and, and together these sometimes create an appearances of openness or closure. These fundamental, powerful, physical things are created through choice. And one of the challenging things that I think anyone who comes to analyze a work of art has to face up to is a kind of responsibility to understand why they are one way and not the other. Why is it small, not, uh, not large? Why is it rough, not smooth? Why is it asymmetrically composed rather than symmetrically composed? There are answers to those things, and they are generally answers that drive you toward an understanding of the meaning of the work. And those are the things that we will try to engage students in investigating. Now beyond the physical structure of the painting, of course, we engage in the world in which paintings tell us about something outside themselves. Tell the story of the real Dr. Gross. Take us to a place where we are not, na where we are not now. Hi there. Um, and take us um, uh, to a place and to a time um, that may be far away, that may be in some paintings imaginary. But broadly speaking, paintings function in this communicative way, in this communicative world on several levels. And again, although probably painstaking the obvious, I think it's, it's useful to think about the various levels at which a work of, of, of visual art can function. It exists, first, it exists first of all as a purely physical object. And then it may describe or portray something that is so familiar to us that it needs, well, that it, I suppose you could say, is obvious. Even as when we see a person on the street, we recognize that as a fellow human being. We recognize a fellow human being in this painting. Behind, this, behind that first recognition come a number of things that we can say that are based on our understanding of what elements of the painting represent. We see a human being dressed in 19th century dress, dressed in uh, the dress of a particular class, dressed, uh, equipped with a certain type of set of implements and tools, all of which explain to us what is going on in ways that we could not understand unless we came equipped with a knowledge of medicine, 19th century dress, um, the hierarchy of privilege in, uh, in Western society. We are led into an understanding of those things through this painting. In art history, we frequently talk, we often call that iconography. Beyond that, and this is frequently where I think, and in this pa these paintings particularly, with much of the excitement will come, we can see through this painting a window into a culture and a world, a reflection not just of what these particular people are doing in this particular place, but what this activity, what this, uh, activity tells us about the society that inframes them, about 19th century Philadelphia, about America in the period after the Civil War, about the role of, uh, of science and, and, uh, and, and empirical st investigation in this, uh, in this time in our society, about the values of a culture. Uh, that was powerfully industrial, um, enormously expansionist in geographic terms. Those stories stand behind this painting as well. And I think our challenge is to take students in the front door offered by the powerful and, and, and sensuous visuality of this painting, take them through that door, through its physical form and into the, great, into the stories and narratives that it can tell us. There's one great difference, of course, between a painting and a work of literature. And this is the last thing I'll say, and that is that when you flop a book down in front of a student, it rarely makes a first impression, at least rarely makes a positive first impression. <laughs> a painting always makes a first impression, and an enormous amount of what we think we feel about a painting comes from those first moments of inquiry. And I think one of the great challenges for us in talking about these paintings with our students this year is going to make sure that that first impression, while captured, is only the first impression. And that the further investigation of this painting leads them to see things that they didn't see at first. And while that, the value of that impression, and in fact its artistic integrity and reality is significant, there's much more to see. And the trick is to keep things going until those further things are seen. And with that, I'm very glad to turn things over to Kathy Foster. Well done. We did not rehearse this at all. And I was going to say some of those things, and you did a better job of it. Yeah. Anyway, but before I dive into the painting. Uh, I think repetition is one of the fundamentally. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. We have a chair here, and we have some yeah. little, like a fanny or two can kind of be. Um, Sit on the back of the 
put on the back of the because come close and you know, this, uh, this it is also true that it is on the floor. perfectly acceptable to sit down yes um, so if you're comfortable seated on the floor um, do it we're going to be here for a while um, and I want that chair to be used so I can Got it. okay All right. Okay. You can take turns if it's uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In the realm of repetition, I was going to start out by, again, I mean, by saying exactly what David did. So I'll just say it in slightly different terms, which is that this is a physical object. It is a great big piece of fabric with patches of color on it. Um, and we need to think about it as an invented thing. And the, and the other way to say that is this is not a photograph. And that's very important. For Aikens especially, but also didactically for you, because you're going to be showing them a picture in your discussion groups. You're not going to be standing in front of either this picture, which is going to be in conservation, or the Agnew Clinic, which will be here. But you will be dealing with a projected image. And especially for a realist painter like Aikens, who has a reputation for being photographic, it's important to assert from the very beginning that this is an invented object. It is a series of choices of brushworks, exactly all the stuff that you were saying about um, composition, color, light. And, and so this is not a photograph. And all of you in this room right now can look at this thing and understand the paint that's involved in this picture. And it's partly that Aikens has this reputation for telling it like it is, that he was a guy who just shoved reality in your face and, like a camera, was selecting nothing, rejecting nothing, just giving you the world dished out. No, 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 no. There are so many choices, so much selection in this. And you that's invisible. And that's the sort of thing you try to bring out in discussion. But even in in the face of this picture, you can feel how it's made out of paint. It's really, it's made out of paint. And so that's one thing to just keep driving, because I think the students are used to looking at photographs. They use, they're used to judging this like it's a photograph of a real event. And so the first thing that we have to do is just draw the air out of that fiction, that this is something that really happened. And remember that this is a completely invented occasion that Aikens made. And everything he did in this picture, he did on purpose. Are we planning on showing the sketch? Yes. Because I was going to say that would help. That's sure doing that. The sketch is really made out of paint. Absolutely. But so that is um, message number one. Message number two has to do with remembering, and this is a good thing, that all these students have probably never heard about the Gross Clinic before. They've never heard about Thomas Aikens before. They have no prior experience of this picture or of the reputation of this artist. And that, in a way, is a good thing. Because for me, after thinking about Aikens for 30 years, I'm really used to this picture. And in a way, it's, it has become normalized. And this is one of the risks of scholarship, that a painting, we forget the first impact of the painting, because we start to know so much about it, and so much about the artist, and about all the scandals, and so forth, that we forget that first impact. So I want you, and in a way, those of you who have no experience of Aikens before are at an advantage, to think about how scary this picture really is. This is a deeply upsetting picture. It was very upsetting in 1876. They wouldn't even let it into the Centennial Art Exhibition because it was deemed too upsetting. It's a really violent painting. And we have become, in the course of our lifetime, so used to violence in, in imagery that it isn't as upsetting to us. But I'm here to tell you it's still an upsetting picture. It's an upsetting picture. And that needs to be examined. So while we calmly walk through the color, light, balance, and all that kind of stuff, we need to think about what is Aikens doing? It's an extremely aggressive picture in that he is pressing blood and gore right up to the front and making you look at a surgery. It's a very scary thing. And certainly in 1876, it would have been quite scary. And Aikens was roundly criticized for this. And in fact, it, it cost him, in a way, his reputation for the rest of his life for being so aggressive. So that, that first impression, I don't know whether your students you know, want to talk about whether they like to see Halloween slasher movies and stuff like that, how they feel about seeing surgery. Because sometimes even people who are used to violent images in the movies are going to be upset by surgery. They don't want to see something that's a kind of everyday, bloody situation. So that's a, 
a place to tap into to talk to the students about whether they feel that attitudes have changed about showing something very private and violent in this way. So that's that's something to just kind of re refresh ourselves on uh, the shock value that this painting still has. And I, I have to say, I, you know, I lur lurk around in this gallery and watch people come up to this painting, and they are horrified. I mean, look at the blood on Dr. Gross's hand. It's slippery. It, it just, it's really, ugh. Yeah. And so that quality is right there, and it needs to be remembered as we try to figure out kind of rationally and intellectually about the, the way that the picture's put together. Well, the other thing about this picture, apart from it's just the violence right up at the front, is it is an extremely confusing picture and provocatively confusing, deliberately and intentionally provocatively confusing. The figure of the, of the patient on the operating table, almost nobody can figure this picture out the first time they look at it. And they are kind of repelled by the sense that they're looking at something that they shouldn't be looking at. That, that is this sense of prurience that you kind of want to figure it out and then you don't want to look and this sense that you maybe you're going to see something you shouldn't be seeing. In fact, you're seeing the hindquarters of the patient, which, you know, that's shocking in its own way. Like, oh my gosh, what? when people just come up and they think it's a leg or a shoulder or something and then they go, oh my God, I'm really looking at the buttocks of this person. And that is, always takes people by surprise. So there's that. The thing that Akins is doing to you in making you get curious and look and then sort of going, whoo, you know, and you take a step back when you realize what you're looking at. This is very hard to figure out. And that tantalizing quality that makes you look and not want to look is part of the whole art of this picture. This is a little boy, uh, a teenage boy on the operating table. His head is underneath this napkin here. It's a, it's a, dish towel, basically. It's a piece of, um, of uh, gauze bandage that um, they, he's, the anesthesiologist, Dr. Barton, has shaken some chloroform on it. That's the art of anesthesiology in 1875, is that you draw the, the, the uh, dishcloth basically closer and farther away from the face of the patient and watch their breathing. I mean, you, if they seem to be too asleep or not enough asleep, whatever, you put more chloroform on. That's the head. And so you're looking at the body coming towards you. And then I the feet are in these little socks, which also masks what's happening for a long time. Because you see a lot of skin, but then you, the socks are there. And you can't quite figure out what they are, because they're not skin color. So the socks, while they're a kind of pathetic, I mean, they make you feel for this little patient. Um, the socks are so kind of homey. On the other hand, they are confusing because they mask you for a minute. The, your ability to see the whole for the calf of the patient and understand the form. So in his choices, Akins has made it very hard for you to figure out what's going on. All you know is that there's really blood involved, and there's this huge gaping cut in the leg of the patient, um, which is really what's taking your attention. So it's a confusing picture. It's aggressive picture. It's a violent picture. Um, it's tantalizing you in these ways. And that is uh, easy, I think, to pull out of your students when they're first looking at this picture, because that's the hardest part of the picture, is trying to figure out what's happening here. Well, what's happening here? What's happening in this picture? What's the story of this picture? There's really two. There are two things happening. What's the first thing that's obvious that we've already been talking about? A There's a surgery going on. OK. A it is in a medical, an amphitheater at Jefferson Medical College. This amphitheater doesn't exist anymore, but it is probably a 360 degree teaching amphitheater. So you see the students um, coming up the back of the, of the canvas here, a portal uh, leading out of the amphitheater. Um, and then you are in the center, kind of the oculus um, uh, of the amphitheater, as if you are there. And that's actually one of the scary parts of this picture. It's a, it's a theatrical and dramatic choice of the artist to make you feel as if you were really, really participating in the clinic um, as one of the, you're the invisible doctor here that's filling in the hole at the bottom of this circle of, of, of doctors. So the first thing that's happening is surgery. You're in a surgical amphitheater. And then what's the second thing that's happening? The mother's teaching. there watching. The mother's watching, but? Teaching. Teaching, right. That's really the second frame of reference. The, the mother, we, we're going to get to her in a minute, because she's definitely part of the story. 
we're teaching. He's stopping what he's doing in order to turn and talk to the people around him, which is an interesting choice, too. He's not paying attention to the surgery. He's actually pausing and addressing the larger group. So the teaching is really important to the story. It is actually what Dr. Gross is all about. And so that, those two things, the surgery and the teaching, are told to you by the events that you see with your eyes. You don't even have to know who any of these people are. You can tell that surgery is going on and that teaching is going on. So those are the two main subjects of the picture. Well, I talked about how the picture is enticing and then repellent at the same time. And there are a lot of things like that that repeat that, that kind of toing and froing. And that's when we get to this little lady over here. How do we know she's the mother? Who said she was the mother? Why do you think she's the mother? <coughs> Well, the charity cases at that time, the parents would have had to witness the uh, event. Would have had to? I think so. I think there was. A man with too much information. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right that the, that the family of the patient was allowed into the surgery. Um, but what's interesting is that there's, other than the fact that it's a woman in street dress, there's really no reason why she would be the mother but she's always called the mother in the literature. It's always the mother. And that, I think Akins is creating a person who is going to be recognized instantly, sentimentally, intellectually, as the mother, even though we don't know any better. And so that, she is. She's absolutely representing the mother. And in, in an interesting way, she can't look. I mean, her gesture is one of hiding. She's so horrified by what she sees. So in a way, Akins has placed a person in the picture to react for you and to go like that. On the one hand, she is a mirror to the audience. But on the other hand, she's the foil to the doctors. And think about how she is the foil to the doctors. What are the doctors all doing? They're looking like crazy. They are really looking very hard. So they are eagerly attending to this event. She doesn't want to see what's going on. So she, the, the, in that comparison between looking and not looking, you get a, a kind of division of the world between the seekers, the doers, the people in action, and the people who are out of the loop, who are not smart, like the doctors, who are ignorant, who are frightened. Do the doctors look frightened? No. Do, if you were? watching this surgery, would you have any fear about the outcome of this? I mean, do these people look like they're in charge? Do they seem to be unhappy, worried, n nervous, um, in any way insecure? This is, this is, you know, not only do you have a team of people working in unison, look at all these hands. All these hands coming together in order to, to work together. It's a, the idea of the clinic is that you have people working together. And a majestic figure of leadership here who is also teaching to younger doctors around. So you have, a, I think, I think, a picture of competence here, of accomplishment, of focus, of discipline, of training, et cetera, that is to be distinguished from the kind of ignorance of the lay person who doesn't have a medical education, who is not a party. I was, I've often wondered why she's hiding her eyes, because um, in the angle, at least as far as we can see, she couldn't see even if she had her eyes open, because Dr. Gross is blocking her view, unless, unless he's walking around. And it occurred to me um, at some point that maybe she's actually reacting to something she's hearing. either. <laughs> Um, <laughs> either the, the sound of the scraping of the, uh, yeah. or, or even the sound of the, the sound of the surgery. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Huh? yeah. Great, if, uh, great. Yeah. Um, absolutely. But the space is not that clear. It's quite possible that she it would have an angle. She's, and that's another of the yeah. issues in terms of clarity of space that she seems too small. She seems, she seems too small. far away. Yeah. She seems, yeah. yes, she, she's sort of tucked in there. And I think that this is a place of uh, pictorial license. Because in fact, if you try to draw a map of where everybody is, she doesn't quite work. We've also, I mean, in light of your comment about whether she can see, here's another person here. Mm -hmm. Here's his knee, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here's his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And actually, here comes his hand. He's <laughs> holding the retractor. There's another doctor back there that we can't even see. There's so many people. 
Because there have to be doctors on either side of the to wound hold pulling the, it apart. To hold the incision open, right. So it is, um, yeah. it's a even fuller circle than you thought. But returning to David's point about contrivance and choice, um, Aikens has organized these people around the surgical table in order to <coughs> tell you as much as he wants you to know. And that all, you know, that, that he could have spiraled this table in any of a number of directions. He chose this way. And he had some gains by this way, and he had some confusions created by this way. It's a kind of balance of artifices, um, but certainly what he was, what he al allowed to do by this choice is show you very clearly the incision. And that then had implications for the way in which you would see the rest of the body. So thinking about all those choices, we have to say, well, the mother got kind of pushed over in the corner there, but there really wasn't any other place for her to go. And I just say, you know, yeah. I mean, she's not small because that's the way she really looked. She's not small because there wasn't room to make her big. She's small because Aikens wanted her to be small. That's, that's as much room as he yeah. wanted to give her, yeah. exactly. Yeah. There's a room almost exactly like this that's still preserved at the Pennsylvania the Hospital. The top yes. of Pennsylvania Hospital. Yes. And the table is almost identical to this table. It's still there. Uh, just a question about another thing. Which is incidentally open to the public. You can go in all, most working days. Mm -hmm. uh, and go up to I'm the thinking top. about the students looking at this. This particular surgery would be called minor surgery now, but it was, this is pre-antibiotic. So I'm, I don't know, maybe Dave would give me a sense of what percent of people actually died of infection uh, in, at that time. So the, the competence of the doctors uh, is probably in the face of a fairly high mortality rate once you open bodies up like that at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of the interesting things about this painting compared to the Agnew Clinic, that this yes, painting is 1875, and Lister's work on surgical antisepsis is incomplete, and doctors like Agnew would have worn that morning coat and, and worn it just to surgery, and then they would have switched to their regular coat, mm -hmm. took great pride in how much blood was in their coats. Um, so, you know, nobody's wearing, doing anything in something here. And the other interesting thing for me, I'm an anesthesiologist, the other thing is that they're using chloroform, mm -hmm. which was not widespread in the United States, uh, mm -hmm. whereas in the Agnew Clinic they're using open drop ether, which was the more common practice in the United States. So chloroform is much trickier to administer. So in Europe and England, because the English couldn't believe that a, an ordinary you know, not trained scientists in the United States could invent something like ether. They had to get a do something better, more scientific. And chloroform is very hard to administer, so it required a medical practitioner. And uh, where ether, anybody could do it. And the joke was, they find the janitor. So the interesting thing is, the man standing above the anesthesiologist is the janitor, and it's almost like. That gentleman's mm -hmm. the janitor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, it's kind this, of interesting as an yeah. anesthesiologist yeah. to see yeah. this thing. It's kind of like, okay, the janitor can't be in this one because he's because they're using a different anesthetic. Yeah. All right. I need to talk to you because I yeah. have actually a completely different story about ether. But anyway, that's a, it's, <laughs> that's a, a an it was interesting only conversation. In 1846, yeah. Yeah. So it's new. Any kind of surgery yeah. at all, 1446, you would have died. You know, people had a high mortality. So this. The idea of even doing a minor operation is still relatively new. In However, Dr. Samuel Gross was very proud of the fact that he never lost a patient on the operating table. Now, it may well be that they died of infection later, exactly. But in fact, even in this day, this was not a life-threatening piece of surgery. Um, and, and it, but it's a big part of the story here. And so now we're going to get a little deeper into the background um, on this picture and on Dr. Gross. Yeah. One question. And that is, I mean, I agree with you that the two major activities are the surgery and the teaching. I think a freshman wouldn't automatically recognize this as teaching, both because his mouth isn't open and he's not, and he's not gesturing in any mm -hmm. obvious way mm -hmm. to the patient. And unless they have the information already that this is likely to be an amphitheater, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very clear that that's mm -hmm. the other really important object in the painting or the really important focus of the painting, but I think the the fact that it's teaching is something that will have to be added for lots of kids. I'm not sure they would automatically well, include that. Well, you can see if you can pull this out. I mean, the, the, the thing that's also physically interesting about the setup is that uh, um, in these amphitheaters, he is lit from the 
eye of the oculus. And surgery in this day was um, between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon because you had to get good light. And so that's a naturalistic touch like the table, like the surgical bench um, that shows Aiken's paying attention. But that has huge emotional, psychological ramifications for what it does to Dr. Gross's head. And it's how you know that he's in yeah. charge here, is he's the treatment the of the guy. light on his forehead so that you get this sense of his wisdom, I mean, literally, like beaming from his head. Um, because, but it's natural light. And so this is a, this is a way in which an, a natural, naturalist painter, a realist painter, can use effects of the real world in order to create an emotional effect. So the light falls on his hand, it falls on his head, and the, the major story of the picture um, is revealed by the light in the room. Well, well that, wonder, yeah. in terms of teaching, whether he's uh, been addressing the audience, he's, uh, at, he's waiting for one of the students to answer his question. Mm -hmm. And I, if I was a student, I'd be kind of terrified. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, to get to that subject of teaching, then you would just ask your students, what's, who are these people in the background? And why are they there? Where are we? What's going on in this room? Um, and then why, why has he stopped? Um, is he just taking a breath? Or is something else going on in the picture? Because I think that's very good to think about whether they're going to see this at all. A purely practical point, the students in all likelihood will have read an essay and know that this is a surgical amphitheater and it's a scene of teaching. Yeah, yeah. So that while they may have faced some of these questions when they were first looking at the painting at home, by the time we see them, they will probably have got If that. they've done the reading. Yes, yeah, they've done the reading. Well, they'll always be a few. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, always, there's always the third that happens. Um, um, I have a question just of curiosity. The gross, of course, is a word that applies to this picture in modern parlance. Was the word gross in that time, did the word gross in the United States mean uh, disgusting, offensive, as it does now? It's about 60s or 70s. I don't no. think so. I think gross would have meant large. Yeah, yeah. just large. Yeah, so I think the, the word has come yeah. to mean something. So there, when they see the gross clinic, and, and they see yeah. the sort of connection, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. wouldn't be one that would have been made at the time. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of things yeah. it now means yeah. something else. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. A very, that's a good point. I work on disgust. I can assure you that gross is the principal meaning right now. It is gross. So the question yeah. is, it wasn't that, though, at that time. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, it okay. wasn't. That's interesting. All right, but in, department, in the Department of Background Information, Dr. Gross was the most famous surgeon in the United States at the time. He was the head of surgery at Jefferson. He was probably the most famous surgeon in the world. He had written a famous textbook on surgery that had been translated into eight languages. He wrote the pocket field guide to surgery that all of the soldiers, the medical um, doctors both north and south, carried in their vests in the Civil War. Um, so he was a household name for people in the medical business. He really was very, very very famous. So this is just not anybody. And in addition, he is performing a particular um, procedure that he invented. And he was famous for also being innovative as a surgeon, inventing literally new tools, new strategies, and in this case, a new treatment for osteomyelitis, which is a disease of the bones. In the past, if you came down with this disease, basically, the best they could do for you was lop off your leg. because it would have taken over your entire skeletal system eventually. You would have been unable to walk, and it was curtains. So you would have had uh, amputation in order to treat it. What anatomists discovered in the 1840s and 50s was that the way bones worked. I mean, it's interesting for me, for you, and certainly for the students to realize the galloping advances in medicine and in anatomy in the 19th century in literally understanding how bones regenerate. And what Dr. Gross did by understanding literally simple mechanisms of bone growth was that you could go in, scrape out the bad disease part of the bone, close up the wound, and the bone would regrow. And that kid will walk away, assuming he doesn't get an infection. So that is, in fact, a dramatically more conservative treatment for this disease than taking the leg off. It's a very, actually, rather small incision, a very neat 
procedure. In other words, it has a kind of beauty to it to just simply go in and take that disease out and then have the bone heal itself. So what you are witnessing in this particular surgery is the revolution in science that had taken place in medicine, in surgery, in the previous three decades. This brings me to the other person in the painting here. This is Thomas Aikens up here taking notes. You can see his white cuff and his shoulder leaning forward. He was actually a student in these very lectures at Jefferson. Rumor had it that he considered becoming a doctor himself. He was deeply interested in this, and he knew Dr. Gross's work very well. And Dr. Gross was famous at the beginning of every year of giving a then and now lecture to his students at Jefferson. And he would talk about what it was like to be a student at Jefferson in the 1820s, when he was one of the first classes to graduate, and now. And he was able to say that between 1826 or 24, whenever I graduated, and today, the world has completely changed in medicine. And it was a thrilling lecture. It was meant to get all of the first year medical students very psyched up about the, their, the excitement of the field, about the uh, advances that had been made. And so it was a terrifically inspirational kind of cheerleading lecture. And that's exactly the, the message of this particular surgery. It's a then and now kind of demonstration of then we used to cut off the leg, now we can go in and you know surgically take out just exactly what's needed and the patient uh, improves because we know so much more than we did three decades ago. So that kind of excitement is what lies behind Aiken's choice here. And th so now I'm going to get back to Aiken's. We talked about who Gross is. These are his, um, Dr. Gross's, this is his newest medical student and these are some of his senior assistants in the clinic. Aikens. I said Aikens was at Jefferson in the 1860s taking these classes. He had also taken classes at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. So he had this mixture of medicine and art in his background. And he was, like all of the artists of Philadelphia, enormously excited by the arrival, the news of the coming of the Centennial Exposition. Aikens in 1875 was 31 years old, which I think is pretty breathtaking. That's the, the age of most of your graduate students. And um, this is when he started to uh, embark on this picture. He was 31. He'd been back from Paris for five years and had kind of stalled in getting his reputation going because the Pennsylvania Academy was closed. The building that we know on Cherry Street was under construction. And there were no annual exhibitions in Philadelphia. So there was no way for an artist to kind of get their work out there. So in the spring of 1875 comes a circular to all the painters and artists of Philadelphia saying the centennial is coming. All local artists are encouraged to do something great. Show, show the city how good our artist community is and make yourself your reputation here. Millions of people are coming to Philadelphia. At that point, Aikens made this sketch this is from the spring of 1875. We have a letter from him to a friend in which he says, I've blocked out a new big picture. It's the best thing I've ever done. He knew he was building something really important, really great. And this sketch shows that even at a very early stage, he had a very clear idea of where he was going. Because the highlights of this, that is, the light on Dr. Gross's forehead, the blood on his hand, the little slash of red of the incision here, and then the light around the circle of doctors, it's all there. So he has this in his mind's eye, and he goes to the big canvas and starts to work on it. That plan to make a big splash at the centennial was, of course, you know, the heart of every artist in Philadelphia at the time. Um, Aikens, of course, was crushed when this picture was not accepted for the art exhibition. He had other paintings that were accepted, so he wasn't shut out completely. In fact, he had several portraits and genre subjects. But this was his really magnum opus, and it was probably deeply disappointing to him to have it be rejected by the art committee because it was seen as too frightening, uh, you know, that, that women we're not supposed to see things like this. It was very upsetting. So the picture ultimately was shown in the, and here's a teeny little picture for you to see, which we'll get up on the website. Uh, it was shown in the medical displays, along with a bunch of hospital folding yeah, beds and, hospital. yeah, uh, you know, bizarre sort of scientific um, things uh, adjacent to the, the painting. And you can see the painting in the background in this very same frame. And we think that maybe Dr. Gross had something to do with it being 
allowed in the medical display because Dr. Gross was um, heading up a, a, an international uh, conference of surgeons in Philadelphia at the time of the centennial. And so all of his colleagues from all around the world were coming. And I think Dr. Gross, who was, as I just described to you, a sort of a rock star of surgery in this time, was also a, a very um, egotistical man. And I think wanted to see this picture out um, on view. And so he may have pulled strings in order to have it out. So that was Aiken's hope. What happened, of course, was that the critics were quite divided about this picture. And I think you're going to get some of the taste of that in Elizabeth Johns's um, um, article. Um, many of them, horrified by this picture, repelled by it, found it, nothing artistic in this at all. Um, others, however, just said flat out, this is the most important painting that has ever been made in the United States up to this moment. And so at the very beginning of this picture's public re um, response, you had a huge division of uh, opinion. But what was Aikens intending by this? He was intending not just to make his reputation, but to make a gigantic poster for Philadelphia. He felt that one of the most um, compelling excellences in the city was its medical community. And in the 19th century, Edinburgh and Philadelphia, in fact, the 18th century, Edinburgh and Philadelphia were the two great centers of medical education. And the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, founded in the 18th century, Jefferson founded in the early 19th century, were among great teaching hospitals that have been here for now centuries. This is a city famous for medical education, which is what's happening in this picture. It's about an innovation, it's about leadership, it's about teaching, and Aikens felt very powerfully that this was a message that he wanted to tell at the centennial. So, in turning to sort of bringing to this art and the city theme that is part of your um, program, this was really deeply about art and the city. It was about the greatness of Philadelphia that Aikens himself had participated in, about a man he thought was a hero of modern science. And then, you know, in a very self-centered way, it was a fabulous display of his skill as a painter. This is a picture that pulls on his experience traveling in Spain, his, his um, four years of training in Paris, where he learned to work the, from the human body um, and to paint with this kind of naturalism. It is a picture that is like Rembrandt, it's like Ribera, it's like Velazquez. These are the, the art cognoscenti are supposed to look at this picture and go, ah, oh, you know, Ribera. You, you, it's a quotation, a deliberate quotation from the style of the 17th century that Aikens wants you to understand. Not, I mean, that is, this is the message to people who are interested in art, that he is pulling on all of the skills of the greatest European painters in order to make a very definitively American picture about the modern world. And so Aiken's mission was to be a player in the great old master tradition and, and make it better, make it more scientific, make it more studied, and make it very contemporary. This is, again, we react to the sort of old timiness of their clothing, uh, the Victorian watch chain and so forth. This is a modern guy. This is a, wearing modern clothing. And again, I think that was part of the shocking thing about this picture. So it's hard or needs an effort, I think, to convey to students how shocking it was to see a picture of this scale with modern people looking back at you covered in blood. We'll provide for students to help them calibrate their reaction to this painting some other paintings in the same period. We'll show probably a, a bright impressionist landscape so that the darkness of this painting, and in, in some respects, it's harking back to a tradition that others were rejecting, will be more apparent in this. And we'll show you, mm -hmm. and we'll also show a, pa a painting from the same period in which the subject matter is mythological in which it is not people in modern dress doing modern things, but in which they, in, in fact, some of the same kinds of modern issues are addressed through an allegorical means. Um, that is, those are paths that he chose not to take, paths that were available, paths that were probably even the broader and better paved, better lighted paths at <laughs> this time um, uh, that he rejected. Now, Aikens thought of himself as a reformer, that he was modernizing the academic tradition. Yeah. Um, and that it's, it's interesting to, to think that he thought of himself, in respect to painting, as innovative and as, as kind of brown, groundbreaking. And as he was a teacher, Dr. of course, Gross too. Dr. Gross was as a surgeon. So he's making a kind of parallelism here. He's saying, I'm a witness 
And I'm also in my own field doing the same thing in Philadelphia that you and the medical community are doing in medicine. So he's making a very assertive statement about the power of art and about his position in respect to the European tradition. Let's rise up and go look at the Agnew Clinic. This is um, the second great Aikens Clinic painting. Uh, he made only two. And in this one, almost everything is different. The terms are different. Um, for starters, in that he was approached by uh, the graduating class of 1889 in order to make a commemorative portrait of Dr. Hayes Agnew at, for graduation. And Aikens, who had in the interim between 1876 and, and 1889, had been fired from the Pennsylvania Academy. That was in 1886. And he had gone into a terrible slump. He was not painting much. He got very depressed. Um, and he was just coming out of that slump when the students from the University of Pennsylvania showed up with uh, several hundred dollars in their hands that they had raised and, and asked him to paint a, a single portrait of Agnew, about like this. And Aikens was so excited by doing the Gross Clinic kind of a project again that he said, I'll take your money, but I want to do a big picture. And it's not going to cost you any more, but it's just interesting to me. So he undertook the expansion of the commission in order to work out again all of the same issues that he had undertaken um, in the 1870s. But here, I mean, as you can see, everything is different. He, insofar as it is exactly the same commission, a teaching doctor in surgery, he has tried to work as many changes as he can. The other thing that's held steady is here's Aikens again, at this, in the same place in the canvas uh, as he was in the other picture. All right, all of you, what are some of the differences? You, my doctor friend, you pointed out one of them having to do with sepsis. What's the visual difference that sepsis, the discovery of, of uh, germs. germs of what, what d visual difference has it made in the painting? He's, He's not wearing gloves. He's not wearing gloves. No. 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 Gloves on console. White. 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 Everybody's wearing surgical whites now. And they figured out that there are germs carried on your clothing, that it's smart to have separate clothing for surgery. And that. Bodily fluids. Get over it. That transforms the picture. Dr. Agnew knew very well about the Gross Clinic. It's a, it was a famous picture, certainly by then. And he specifically asked to not have blood on him. So that's also different. He said, I don't want to be covered with blood. And so the blood is very discreet. And Aikens kind of snuck it in there anyway. I mean, I think actually Agnew would have liked it if he had even less. Um, so that's different in the treatment of the doctors and in the treatment of Dr. Agnew himself. All right, what else is really different about this picture? The storage of the instruments looks different. Um, what? The storage of the instruments looks different to me. The, um, the tray yes. looks like it's an organized <coughs> Yeah, tray yeah, yeah. Box. You are going for the like the fine tuning. You think think be more be more ignorant. It's horizontal instead of vertical. Okay. The audience is much closer. All right. I just told you how this story began. That is, the students commissioned the painting, so the students are in the picture, and they came to Aiken's studio and posed for him. So everybody who put fifty dollars into this project got themselves in the picture. So right away. It changes the whole atmosphere because you feel the presence of the students. I mean, you or I can cra cruise through this like every one of us who's ever had a lecture and watched someone sleep in the lecture. You can find the person who's not paying attention here. And so that, that narrative is going on in the background. And it is much bu busier than the background of the Gross Clinic. Was it a matter of comment at the time that there was a medical class of people who all look remarkably alike? <laughs> Well, they're not supposed they're not supposed to upstage Dr. Agnew. You know, the 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 they don't look they look at older than we would expect them to I'm just telling you, these are the students. These are the students. All right, what else is different? You said it. We had it over here. Okay. Gender, gender, gender. Yes. There's ladies here. Not Yes. Yes, and they're not shrieking. In fact, they are engaged. And this is Nurse Clymer, the first graduate of the nursing program at the University of Pennsylvania. <coughs> nurse Clymer with a very distinctive nursing cap. These caps were different for every school. So you identified yourself by your cap. Um, and she is right in the thick 
of medicine. Now, Aikens himself said that he didn't think any woman would ever become a great surgeon. And he also said he didn't think any woman would become a great artist. So this is a kind of a statement for Aikens to bring Nurse Clymer forward um, about the change in the medical profession and the arrival of women in the business. And as I said, he insisted on on equal access to resources for the students at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Women's classes in those days were segregated, but nonetheless, the women could take every single part of the curriculum, which was not true in Paris. I mean, Mary Cassatt went to Paris, and she could not enroll at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts because women were not allowed. But in Philadelphia, women could take every single class that men could take at the Pennsylvania Academy. And this, even though he said, I don't think women will ever be very good. But they will be good enough that it is worthwhile allowing them to be as excellent as they can be. So John it's a Hopkins, kind uh, of. Women right about this time. I don't know. I don't remember the exact year, but it was either right before or right after. All right. Well, this is this is part of the social history of these two paintings. No. Is you can see medical advances between the two. You can see social changes between the two and changes in teaching. Um, this is also. Um, a mastectomy, which is very different from the surgery in the, um, the Gross Clinic, in that mastectomy was almost always mortal. You, I mean, your chances of surviving were tiny for breast cancer um, in 1889. So in, in, in a way, this is a really scary and sad story, and a, in a way also much more shocking than the Gross Clinic, because you really see the patient. You see her face, she's a real person, and you see her breast, which is uh, in a way more private and shocking than just seeing a kind of bony shank of a teenage boy, so that this picture in a way is even more aggressive than the Gross Clinic in getting the surgery out there. But it was, in fact, one of Agnew's uh, specialties um, and, again, a teaching uh, opportunity where he is um, shown instructing his students. The frame. Frame is, the, the Aikens um, frame in that, uh, in the Gross Clinic is the original frame, and this is also the original frame with the inscription in Latin um, that Aikens himself uh, um, wrote. Aikens um, spoke five languages, and um, this is, uh, tells you that he was uh, a dear teacher. I mean, the, the translation of it is, is an homage to his um, lucidity and um, inspirational qualities as a teacher. And indeed, this picture was put on the stage at um, the Academy of Music. Um, for graduation. Penn's graduation was held at the Academy of Music in those days, and the curtain was drawn, and this picture was um, unveiled to an uh, ovations, um, and Dr. S. Weir Mitchell, whose picture is in the other room there, um, accepted this painting on behalf of the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania um, at the Academy of Music. So this picture, in an interesting way, got a completely different reception than the Gross Clinic. Now, over time, had we gotten used to it? Or was it because it was being presented to an audience of doctors and medical students and their families who were completely prepared to understand the context of this picture? Very different than an audience that, at least the centennial audience, might have been women and children and so forth who were not, um, not so inured or no, so prepared, might, one might say, for um, the, the violence of surgery right, right in their face. But in the same way, you are involved, you, are, you become a participant in the surgery, and that's the same. What else about this picture? Well, but you're actually here on the level of the students, not of the physicians. You are actually excluded from the operation. Yes, field. yes, the, you, are, the, you are really the in the, you are among the students. Yep, that's a good well, point. One of the things about the nurse is that she's the only person who really paying close attention, and that's the, the nurse in an OR is responsible for maintaining a sepsis. So she is vigilantly watching and making sure that if you're a medical student, the nurse is the one who's going to wrap you on the knuckles if you, if you are out of line. Or, you know, part of their job is to harass the medical students. And, and Good. So you know, she's the one, who, she's clearly, she's got that demeanor that she's going to make sure these guys, they may be the doctors, but she's going to keep them in line. 
The light source is different, but also the, the amount of white in the picture just is a, a light source of its own. So it creates this sense of clarity and of, of lucidity that's very different from the, from the Gross Clinic, which has this kind of mystery by comparison. My understanding was that Aiden's wife painted his portrait. She himself. did. So if yeah. you think women were good enough, then, but yet he led his wife to good enough. his portrait. Yeah, but it's a very complicated yeah. family dynamic yeah. because his wife basically gave up painting. Right, and I, I put when, uh, once uh, once married to him, it was like the household was not big enough to have two painters, and so she, obviously, she was a prize-winning student at the academy, and she was perfectly capable of painting um, his portrait. But she really did not paint much except before she was married, and then after his death. That's her portrait. That's his, that's her portrait in the other room. Yes. But I think that was m painted posthumously. Do you know what the, the hospital nursing camp that is? The the University of Pennsylvania. University of Pennsylvania. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. because she was a, the first graduate of that. I went there, but I don't, I don't, I mean, it wasn't the cap that was in vogue when I was in medical school. Yeah. But I would sure believe that they, they have changed. Football, I think they have changed, yeah. <laughs> The, one other, one other pen related. This is probably the the one of the two surgical amphitheaters in what's now called Cohen Hall, which was originally Medical Hall, which had been built in the what had been built at about the time that the Gross Clinic was being painted, um, and this painting hung for many years when the new medical school medical amphitheater was built in what's the Morgan Building. It hung over the door into the medical amphitheater. So this was a picture of an amphitheater shown in the context of amphitheaters. You wouldn't have, you know, there was no, there was no doubt that they all, you were showing it to an audience who understood what was going on. And, and just one, one other observation I'd make. The wearing of white must have seemed rather like we would imagine if you saw a group of people in hazmat suits. I mean, mm -hmm. it was very mm -hmm. strange. Yeah. I mean, it must have, I mean, it didn't occur. Or astronauts or something. Yeah, it didn't occur yeah. on the, you didn't see people walking around in white suits. And, it, and the, the extraordinary specialness of it um, must have been shocking. Yes, it would have been just like the Rose Clinic, extremely modern, right, yeah. very modern, yeah. and shockingly modern in showing things that not only had just been invented, but that you didn't see on the street every day. Um, when I show this to my class, I try, my history of medicine class, I tried to find out exactly where this amphitheater was, <coughs> and my uh, hypothesis was that it, I was teaching this in yeah. the fourth floor of Logan Hall, yeah. and that's where I thought it was. Um, it's apparently, it's not exactly clear, but this one guy who wrote a history of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School claims to have found um, the original uh, architectural drawings for um, Huck, for the Huck building across the street, across Bruce Street, and um, that this cannot have been in one of the amphitheaters in Medical Hall, which is uh -huh, now uh -huh, Cohen uh -huh, Hall, uh -huh. but that it was actually in Huck. I still I used to believe that it's in Cohen yeah. Hall. Can I just raise my uh, hand yeah, yeah. And, and repeat the speech that I gave at the beginning, yeah. which is this, both of these pictures are entirely made up. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. the mission to find the yeah. exact room yeah. may be a misbegotten one because yeah. the, lo the more I've studied Aiken's pictures, the more I feel that he's made yeah. stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. And he convinces you that you, you're going to find that amphitheater. But in fact, he's twisted that things yeah. in order to get right. the figures right. And, and so even if there was an amphitheater like this, I bet he played with it a bit yeah. to make it come out straight in a picture. Yeah. Um, at any rate, it, it's, we fall into this with Aikens. We assume that because it looks like this, he must have had a coat like that, he must have, you know. But in yeah. fact, Aikens made up a whole lot of stuff, uh, more than uh, I think that the literature would credit him with. Yes, looking convincing is not the same thing as yeah. being true. Right. <laughs> I mean, and that's the, that's Or I he mean, would say a higher truth here, a higher I, truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned a couple times how dark the other painting is. At the end of the conservation, what do you see as dark? Is, what's happening it's a there? little dirty. Um, it has, the last time it was cleaned was in 1960. So we've got 49 years of smog on that picture. Um, the d varnish may have darkened slightly. So, but it's not going to be revelatory. This picture, d do you remember this picture? Do you remember this picture before the varnish was taken off it in 2000? I mean, it came out like 10 shades brighter. It was unbelievable because it really had orange. Dark too, so 
Yeah. So it was just, whew, it was amazing. It was really transformed. The, the Gross Clinic's not going to be transformed like that. Um, but what we are very interested in studying is the older repairs to the picture that need to be undone or redone um, and damage abrasion to the picture from being over cleaned. Um, overly energetic conservators who went in um, and took off dirt and then took off maybe a little paint as well. Um, our conservator, Mark Tucker, who's worked on all of our collection, has become just now fabulously expert at identifying lost glazes and figuring out how to reconstruct them. And so we may actually get a lot more subtlety out of the picture, not so much a question of brightness as coherence with lost detail that we can kind of patch back in very gently. So that's really going to be fun. It's going to be now, this picture is fine at a fine level. Too. Yes, yeah. it is. Well, it was, it was it's here on loan. But it's kind of interesting that the difference in the two institutions in yes. the treatment of art. <laughs> you noticed that. Thank you. <laughs> no, it, there was a fire um, in the hall, in the building it was in, and the heat in the building went way up, and the varnish blanched so that the people who came in to rescue the painting, it was white and opaque because the varnish had completely become um, well, opaque. It, this was right before the Aikens exhibition. And so it was actually going to be in the show. And it was, so we just, yeah, we just brought it in. Uh, I was not working for the museum then. Brought it in right then, right, you know, triage kind of into the, um, into the conservation studio. Um, the good news was that the heat that had transformed the varnish, that's what varnish is for, it's to protect the paint surface. The paint was fine. It was just a question of taking the varnish off. But having had that scare, the um, medical school said, you know, why don't you guys just take care of it? And so now, with the blessing of the trustees of the medical school, um, this painting is here on loan, and there is a big replica in the place of the painting. So that the, the ghost, so to speak, of Dr. Agnew can still be watching over the students um, uh, and, and the people in that building. Um, Except but the, the room and hangover yeah. is no longer at the medical amphitheater. Well, well, well. But at any rate, you can just, it, this actually is like the Gross Clinic, because you can see this 100 times better than you could the, uh, see the Gross Clinic at Jefferson. This one, the, the, it was over a staircase, very high, um, and with a skylight that glared off it so that no matter where you stood, you couldn't really see the painting. So it just looks way better here. Um, and obviously now it's in really tip-top condition, um, having only been cleaned, what, in 2000, 2001. Um, so the, when the trustees of Penn's Medical School come here for their annual dinner, they all come in and pay their respects to the Agnew Clinic. And, and leave the painting here. And, no, they, and they say, we are so glad it is here, because everybody can see it. It's much easier to find. Um, and it just looks spectacular here. The, um, the website that will be constructed for students and for all of us this summer will contain some of the press coverage about uh, concerning the great campaign to buy the, uh, the Gross Clinic to preserve it in Philadelphia. Um, just as a kind of footnote of the um, uh, cultural history, the re most recent cultural history. Mm -hmm. Just a comment, I don't know how common this is in this situation, but both of the main people do have a scalpel in one hand, I gather, it was left hand. But, but I mean, is that, a, is that, I'm asking the medical people here. Dr. Ackman was actually ambidextrous mm -hmm. and could operate with either. But I'm, I'm asking, is that, is that, is that pose with no, he's Being just back, because he's both of the pictures have both of the pictures have right. a scalpel in there. I'm just curious. That doesn't look typical to you. Well, he's in the middle of operating. Yeah. He's just stepping back yeah. to there, there's, there's a great tradition in, in Western painting of portraiture in which people have attributes of their trade at yes. hand or nearby. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, you know, this certainly is to be understood within, within that. I mean, it's, you know, if we, had, if we had parachuted in from another culture and didn't know what a scalpel was, it wouldn't help us yeah, right. to have this glint, glinting thing in the man's hand. Um, but it is for us, of course, a, a signpost. It's true to, to imagine things being otherwise. What if yeah. he had nothing in his hand? Yeah. Then how would you know what was going on? Yeah. It's, it's a very important symbol. You well, back there. I think I wanted to ask why you all think it, it, it is a mastectomy. Oh. Interesting surgery to be chosen. I think it was why a mastectomy? 
specialty. Uh, about the mastectomy, there was a uh, famous surgeon in Boston at the time who developed the radical mastectomy, mm -hmm. which was re regarded, and that involved an extensive lymph node dissection to get all the cancer. That was regarded as a major medical breakthrough until about the 60s or 70s when we discovered that lumpectomy without the yeah. dissection yeah. was actually a better technique mm -hmm. and far less disfiguring. So this was probably regarded, though, and this is a radical mastectomy in the Halstead fashion, as another major medical advance, because for 70 years, people thought this was saving lives from breast cancer. So this is not likely in other pain, this is also a great procedure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think it was just before, I think Halstead's first Halstead. radical mastectomy is like 92 or something, and yeah. this is 1889. So, I, I can't be sure about that, but I, I, I think this would have been a conventional mastectomy rather than a whole big prostate. I think, I think that the, the, the plainly revealed female body in this di you know, mm -hmm. the almost dissecting room atmosphere is something that it will inevitably interest people. It deserves attention. Um, compared to the ambiguity with which the body is shown in gross, mm -hmm. there's no ambiguity mm -hmm. about this at all. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, of, of directness, the obvi obvious objectification of the female body here, are things for which we have vocabulary. It's not much of the, it's, it's certainly not a component of the response that one re that re reads about this painting in its own time, at least as far as I can think <laughs> of. Um, it was, you know, it was like seeing something ordinary or it was to be expected in this, in this context. The heroic nurse may be the more unusual thing. Mike? Could you go back to the question, why did he, of all the possible operations, oh. why must that to We have no statement any place that says this is why. Um, it, was, it, it was not exactly a signature of surgery for Agnew, so in, in a way you could ask the same question, because Agnew was a kind of all-purpose surgeon and it was not his specialty. So my only thesis is actually that Aikens liked the idea of, the bo of painting the body in this yeah. way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it seems to be more about Aikens' choice than it would be that it tells you a lot about Agnew. Um, however, because the surgery is taking place on the other side of her body, so you're not actually looking into the wound in the same way yeah. that you are for the gross clinic, it's an excuse to paint a nude woman in surgery with actually very little blood and gore showing since Agnew had stipulated that he didn't want a lot of blood. Having just gotten in trouble, and lost his position for doing nudes and females and bringing that stuff together. So he finds a perfectly good reason to, to paint a nude, yes. <laughs> Why on earth would he make that choice? Because he was that kind of a guy. <laughs> he absolutely was that kind of a guy. <laughs> he would just steer right back into trouble. Kathy, in the upper left hand corner, the figure where we only see the hands and the Yes. Looks like he's holding a knife. Yes, he's cutting a, 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 yeah, he's carving his initials or something into, into the, the railing, yes. Is this a, in, in, I have to say, you know, one of the odd things to me about this is I feel the, uh, the, the audience is, uh, let's put it this way, it wouldn't be an audience I'd be happy to be, te be <laughs> teaching for. They're slouching, they're bored, they don't seem to be paying much attention, there seem to be some sort of private moments going on, <laughs> not much related to the surgery, and then you have somebody who's using a knife in a way that's, that's, that's sort of reckless and boyish, as opposed to precise. And I can only assume that we have a certain amount of studio adjusting going yeah. on here. Yeah. That Aikens yeah. and the students who were cooperating with him were having private jokes. I, of course, no Because it was very clubby, I think. Oh, I think, yes. I think yeah. that that's, that's, yeah. I think that's really a component part of it. It is, a, in a sense, li almost literally a medical fraternity yeah. gathering yeah, for There's this. There's a collaborative yeah. quality there. This is a horizontal composition, and you also have the division yeah. of the doctor right. and the surgery. Right. Right. That is, whereas the um, growth clinic builds to this pyramid, mm -hmm. here you have the, the um, so you, you can see Aikens working out the alternatives, yeah. saying in the first one it was a vertical composition with people packed together. This is going to be horizontal with people distributed to the sides. Um, in a way, suiting himself, pleasing himself by trying different Trying different solutions. Yeah, these that go yeah. I mean, and it has a sort of, you know, sort of management, a new management model in the operating room. The the, the team, um, all sorts of of new professional standards across across different in different professions at this time are being established. Practices are growing larger of all kinds: law, medicine, architecture, 
engineering practices are all being transformed at this time, professionalized, <coughs> dressed up. We can all aspire to having a retirement portrait painted yeah, of us yeah. that describes us as, <laughs> as venerated and loved. Most. <coughs> yes, yes, the most. I, I'm going to translate to uh, most compassionate. Most, most compassionate? Carissima. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, actually, most. But there's carisimus. Yeah, carisimus. Yeah, yeah, carisimus means. Uh, most beloved. Does it? Car yeah. That's <laughs> what, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm willing Caris. to be corrected. Yeah. But yeah. Car means dear. Yeah. Uh, most I dear. Mean, My dear professor. Yeah, yeah. 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 But most. Yes, dearest of all. Can I say something about antisepsis and, and asepsis? Because um, it's, it's interesting, this is sort of a transitional moment, 1889. We already mentioned that in uh, 1875, there's, uh, there's, there's, no, um, uh, there's no white, there's no sterile field, there's no uh, yeah. antisepsis or anything. Um, Lister first published on his antiseptic method in 1865. Gross, had he chosen to, could certainly have used uh, antisepsis mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, 1875, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he didn't, and many doctors didn't. Many doctors were hostile to antisepsis because antisepsis is simply the spraying of chemicals to kill germs, spraying of chemicals into the wound or around the wound to kill germs. Um, and the chemicals first used for that were themselves destructive and caustic. Mainly carbolic yeah. acid, yeah, uh, which could Ugh. be. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> But many doctors were hostile to it, in, in part because it implied that doctors were the ones responsible for killing their patients by introducing germs mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. the wound. Um, asepsis is often thought to be a logical outgrowth of antisepsis. Asepsis is the prevention of uh, the possibility for germs to enter the surgical field through scrupulous cleanliness and mm -hmm. sterilization of instruments, et cetera, the gloves, the masks, and everything like that. In fact, asepsis, what Lister did not, Lister himself, the father of antisepsis, didn't believe in cleanliness at all. He said cleanliness is completely irrelevant. We just have the just germs kill are those there, guys. We have to kill them. Asepsis was initially uh, a doctrine in opposition to antisepsis. Mm -hmm. A contending and theory of It's yeah, only yeah. now in retrospect that we see them as sort of siblings or one as a This is fantastic. Yeah, 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 I love yeah, this yeah, information. Yeah. <laughs> uh, both antisepsis and asepsis took a while to gain general uh, acceptance among uh, surgeons. 1889, we certainly do see the white. Mm -hmm. We see efforts to maintain uh, a clean, you know, if not sterile surgical field. We don't see the introduction, we don't see antisepsis, and we don't see the gloves, we don't see the masks, but it's sort of a, a transitional moment. Um, and so it's, so it's certainly in contrast to the Gross Clinic. It, it shows in mm -hmm. just that 14 year period that, you know, the norms are changing. And had he painted the same thing 10 years later, we have Halstead himself, the radical mastectomy, mm -hmm. was responsible for the first use of gloves. Uh, and so by, by 1900, uh, you uh, begin to see much more, uh, you, you would see a very different scene. You'd see, uh, likely see gloves and masks and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. sterile field. I've asked Kathy just to say a couple of words about the Henry Ozawa pa Tanner painting that's across the yes, way. Yes, turn yourself around, and this is Aiken's great student, Tanner. Just because we can, we can put this on the website too for the students to test their skills. It's a nice um, demonstration of the legacy of Aiken's teaching because Tanner took these principles of naturalism to religious subject matter. And he had painted this just after coming back from the Middle East. He'd been traveling in Palestine and he decided to visualize the Annunciation as if you know, you are there um, in the first century. And so he has uh, Mary, really like a teenage Palestinian girl, wearing the costume of the period, I mean, of, of the region. Um, so again, although she's exotic in distance, she's actually a contemporary woman. Um, and I think Tanner's message was to make her real. I mean, this is the, this is the era of, of, of the Renan's life of Christ when the idea of thinking about Christ as a real man was um, uh, the sort of the newest wave of religious thinking. And so here we have Mary seen really as a teenage Palestinian girl. But in conjunction with that kind of naturalism, you have the depiction of the angel as a bar of light. And it's a, in a way um, 
very consistent with the naturalism of Aikens and Tanner. Um, like Courbet, who said, I've never seen an angel, so I'm not painting one. Um, and Tanner said, I understand this as a spiritual event, um, that the angel didn't walk across the carpet you know, with real feet, but was a vision to Mary. And so he just imagined this as a vision of light. Um, so he's taking Aiken's naturalism here um, into a spiritual place. And it's a very interesting way to, to take that uh, academic, that realist legacy, um, and yet produce something that is intentionally, uh, intensely spiritual. So this is not far off the Agna Clinic just 10 years later. Yeah. Kathy, thank you very, very much.